We are delighted to have Professor Sir Rory Collins here uh, to present the 2022 Sharp Lecture. Now, Professor Sir Rory Collins does not need any introduction to most of us, but if you don't know who he is, he is probably <clears throat> the, one of the leading researchers in cardiovascular uh, disease worldwide, and he has also been the principal investigator of UK Biobank since 2005. And as, as you've seen today in the previous lectures, it's been highly productive. The UK Biobank, even, even last week, I think in the, in the media, uh, there was a study on the sort of polygenic risk scores in colorectal cancer published. So uh, Sir Rory was uh, knighted for his services to science in 2011, elected to the Royal Society in 2015, and awarded the UK MRC's 2020 Millennium Medal for his national and international research contributions. So, Welcome, Sir Rory, and we are delighted to have you to speak to us uh, on the 2022 Sharp Lecture with the title Cardiovascular Disease Prevention, a Popular Population-Based Perspective. So, Sir Rory Collins. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to come and uh, talk at the Sharp meeting. I've been to Sharp meetings in the past, and it's, it's very nice to, to come back, so thank you for that. Um, what I want to do is kind of just throw out some ideas about how we should think about um, cardiovascular disease prevention. There's a lot of talk about precision medicine and focusing on individual patients, um, but it may be that sometimes by trying to be over precise, um, we actually have adverse consequences. Uh, so the kind of background to this is this kind of idea that um, you Biology is, is a um, continuum, uh, but we tend a lot of the time in medicine to be splitters. You hypertension, not hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, not hypercholesterolemia. Um, and, and the question is whether that, um, that, that splitting approach uh, actually uh, is appropriate a lot of the time and, or whether it uh, results in um, some if you like, inappropriate behaviors. And as I say, the dividers uh, have been really very much involved in a lot of the work around the guidelines <clears throat> uh, and around the ways in which one should uh, determine um, whether or not somebody should get uh, an intervention and then um, what kind of intervention they should get. And I think the consequence of that has been that the focus has been much more on managing the risk factor levels than on managing risk itself. And so that's really the, the kind of focus of my talk. So here are the 2018 ESC, ESH guidelines that in the past would have come out of a smoke-filled room, now come out of a smoke-less filled room, but, but the room heats up. <laughs> and there are lots and lots of discussions around, you know, what what is hypertension what is not hypertension how do you determine hypertension and then what should you do once you've determined that someone has hypertension um, and uh, in 2022 uh, the updated nice guidelines talked about how valuable it was to use ambulatory uh, blood pressure monitoring to determine whether or not someone was or wasn't uh, hypertensive And to some extent, I think that this is more of a statistical anomaly than a clinical one. So this kind of concept that there is a point at which risk increases substantially um, uh, at a level of a risk factor, maybe the way in which we look at the data. So, so here are data um, from um, a meta-analysis that was done some time ago, pulling together about 60 prospective cohorts with about a dozen years of follow-up from around the world, looking at blood pressure uh, and the risk of, of stroke in this case. And you have this curvilinear association, uh, and there's that point where the arrow is, where it looks as if the, the kind of curve is taking off. But if, as we've been doing for a lot of the time over the last two years, we plot this not on a, this kind of normal scale, but on a log linear scale, where essentially on the y axis we have a doubling or log scale. 
the data actually show that it's a straight line relationship. That is the same absolute difference in blood pressure is associated with the same proportional difference in risk throughout the range. So given that that's the data, at what point does someone become hypertensive? The idea of splitting doesn't really kind of fit with the data. And the idea that one would really want to know whether they are just above or just below the point of that arrow by using laboratory monitoring, that kind of precision um, doesn't really seem to make much sense when you have this log linear association. So I think it argues against, at least for blood pressure, um, the concept that there is a point at which people become um, at risk where you uh, are due to hypertension. Half of all stroke and coronary disease is due to non-optimal blood pressure levels. That's not above that point. It's non-optimal within a population. And that will depend not just on their blood pressure, but on other risk factors that might put them at higher risk or at lower risk. And then the question is, what does blood pressure do? Does that push them to a level of risk at which you would want to intervene? And half of the um, uh, half is among people without so-called hypertension. Half is among middle-aged people, but a lot of our risk scores are largely driven by age. And so uh, when people come into general practice um, and, and scores are done, age is really such a dominant factor in it that we may underestimate the importance of intervention in uh, younger individuals who, ha who, who have uh, risk for other reasons. And this shows the effects of uh, lowering blood pressure among people at different um, absolute levels of starting blood pressure. So uh, for both stroke and coronary artery disease, the proportional reduction in risk um, is the same for the same absolute reduction in blood pressure, irrespective of whether you're starting at a very high level or starting at a, at a very low level. So consistent with the observational epidemiology, of a log linear association, uh, so too with the randomized trial evidence that um, lowering blood pressure uh, by a certain absolute amount lowers risk by the same proportional amount, irrespective of the starting uh, point. So if we start to think about, well, well what are we trying to do when we lower blood pressure? Um, then having decided that someone is at high enough risk to lower their blood pressure, um, we want to lower their blood pressure. And we know that monotherapy uh, is, is not particularly effective at lowering blood pressure. Um, and if you increase doses of a single agent, what you do is not get very much further increase in the blood pressure reduction, but you do get quite a big increase uh, in the side effects. By contrast, you combination therapy um, uh, can produce bigger reductions in blood pressure and, and avoid that effect of, of um, side effects due to increasing the, a single agent. And this shows the data here, this, the, the white bar is showing the blood pressure reduction of the single agent, the, 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 the uh, bar on the, on the right showing the effect of doubling the dose. So the, con the, the concept of combinations clearly makes sense. And yet, when we look at the guidelines, the focus is on um, titrating up. Whereas it would seem to make much more sense to think, well, someone is at high enough risk to lower their blood pressure. Let's lower their blood pressure by giving them combination therapy. And if we need to titrate down, um, uh, because there's, a, there's the concern that you start people on a single agent, they don't get very much blood pressure reduction, um, and nothing, you, nothing much more happens after that. And indeed, we have these very complex uh, guidelines 
these are the ones from the British Hypertension Society, but um, uh, you would get these sort of guidelines from um, the International Hypertension Society, the American societies, very detailed ways of, of, com of combining depending on you're starting with one, do one regimen, start adding another regimen, adding another regimen, adding another regimen, whereas really what you're trying to do is lower blood pressure. So having decided, as I say, that someone's at, at enough risk to lower their blood pressure, why would you not just start with a combination, perhaps of a moderate dose of uh, um, a few different agents? And the, again, the evidence from the randomized controlled trials, this is a meta-analysis of the randomized trials by the Blood Pressure Learning Treatment Trialist Collaboration run out of <clears throat> the Georgia Institute in Sydney, shows that the reductions in the risk here of coronary artery disease or the reduction in the risk of stroke is dependent not on the agent used, but on the blood pressure reduction that's produced. So the, the absolute reduction in blood pressure, irrespective of the agent, is what determines the proportional reduction in risk. So again, this concept of uh, complicated um, guidelines where you start with a particular agent, add another particular agent, then add another particular agent, um, isn't actually supported by the randomized trial evidence on cardiovascular outcomes, which indicate it isn't the agent, it's the blood pressure reduction that matters. And this focus on lowering the risk factor level and not on the risk uh, is having another um, uh, perverse impact because what it's doing is it's getting people to think about, well, right, I want, I've decided they're hypertensive. I've done all these tests to determine they're hypertensive. I'm going to, I've gone through this very complex titration to lower their blood pressure. All done. But the reason for lowering their blood pressure is not to lower their blood pressure. The reason to lower their blood pressure is to lower their risk. And so having determined they're at high enough risk to lower their blood pressure, why would one not be looking at other ways to lower their risk? Seems obvious, but it's not what happens. So if you look at recent trials or if you look at recent registry data, in people who are being treated for hypertension, the minority of them are actually having their lipids lowered. So as I, again, as I say, they're considered to be high enough risk to lower their blood pressure, and then they're not getting their uh, LDL reduced. And indeed, if you look in the 2018 ESC, um, ESH blood pressure management guidelines, in the 98 pages, there is only a single page on all other risk factor modifications that you might consider. Um, in someone with hypertension. So you can kind of see this really, as I say, perverse focus on a particular risk factor rather than thinking, what am I actually trying to do here, which is lower their risk. And I should say within that one page, there's only a little bit on, on lipid lowering. And yet we know, again from the randomized control trials, here from the cholesterol treatment trials meta-analysis, uh, of all the large long-term randomized trials of statin therapy, that lowering LDL with a statin produces the same proportional reduction in risk in people with or without hypertension, as based on treatment, with or with uh, higher or lower uh, blood pressures. So it's not that there's any kind of reason for not lowering their LDL. Uh, we have the evidence that that would produce additional benefit. And switching a little bit from blood pressure now to, towards cholesterol, we can see the same problem occurred. Back in you know, the, the kind of dark ages of lipid lowering, um, when the American ATP3 guidelines came out, um, again, there was this concept that there was a threshold below which lowering LDL cholesterol would not lower risk. Um, and uh, it was only in people with high cholesterol 
that it would be a good idea to lower uh, LDL cholesterol. Again, the evidence that was available well before that showed the same log linear associations between cholesterol and the risk of coronary artery disease. So again, the concept that there is a threshold was not supported by either the, the, by, by the epidemiological evidence, and nor now is it supported by the randomized trial evidence. So this, as with the blood pressure picture I showed, is the randomized trial evidence indicating that a one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol uh, produces the same proportional reduction in risk about 20% um, over a five year period, less in the first year, about 25% per year, every subsequent year, irrespective of your starting LDL cholesterol. And because it's harder to lower a low LDL cholesterol than a high LDL cholesterol, because the statins, for example, um, a torvastatin 40 milligrams will halve your LDL cholesterol. So if you start with an LDL of four, you can lower it by two millimoles. If you start with an LDL of two, you can lower it by only one. Um, and therefore, somewhat counterintuitively, you need to be more aggressive in terms of your LDL lowering regimen in people who are at high risk with lower LDLs than in those with higher LDLs, because it's harder to lower it. But it doesn't matter what your LDL is, um, lowering it will lower your risk. And um, this is just showing it in a different way that um, a bigger reduction in LDL cholesterol will produce a bigger reduction in risk. So with um, my example of 40 milligrams of torvastatin, that will reduce your LDL by about 50%. Um, and uh, if on top of that you can you have a very high risk individual, then you can think about other ways to lower it further, azetamide or some of the newer agents um, such as the PCSK9 inhibitors or or a drug like uh, inclisiran, which works in a similar way. It doesn't matter whether you're people with or without prior cardiovascular disease at different absolute levels uh, of risk, you get the same proportional reduction. I think where there may be a, a big change, and it, it's interesting to kind of see how that plays out, is the observation that was first published in 2017 um, by a PhD student at uh, the Broad Institute in, um, in the US, that the combination of, of variant, genetic variants of small effect across the genome could be used to identify quite a substantial proportion of the population uh, who were at equivalent risk of cardiovascular disease to someone with familiar hypercholesterolemia. But instead of maybe a prevalence of 0.3% with um, familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, this would maybe about 3 to 5%. So the idea that a, this kind of polygenic risk score based on genotyping could identify individuals who are at uh, very high risk, I think may be something that shifts us away from risk scores that are so driven by age to risk scores that start to add in genetic data, uh, where the genetic data will be much more powerful, um, actually rather similarly to the presentation earlier on, on the liver disease, uh, where the genetic predictors will be much more powerful at younger ages than at older ages, um, because they will be the, the, the main drivers. So I think we may well start to see um, these kind of risk scores being incorporated into cardiovascular disease prevention um, in a kind of precision population health way, uh, rather than at an individual level. If we look at lipid lowering, uh, there are two things that matter in terms of getting benefit. Uh, it's the size of the um, absolute LDL reduction um, and the un underlying absolute risk. So if you take people at different levels of absolute risk, you, if you could lower their LDL by two millimoles, um, which if they started around four um, would be pretty straightforward to do, then uh, depending on their absolute risk, you can get bigger and bigger absolute benefits. And yet, um, when we look at uh, the use of statins in 
people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Um, I show on the top a trial that we're doing in the U across the UK, um, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, um, Northern Ireland. Um, the, these are people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. You can see that less than half in both the UK and the US are on high intensity statins, such as say 40 milligrams over 12 of statin. And you've got somewhere of the order of one fifth to one quarter who are on no statin at all. Down here, uh, data from a study from across Scotland. Uh, so this is the proportion who are on statin, again, in cardiovascular disease individuals. Uh, this is high intensity statin um, overall and by age and gender. So we're, we're not using the things that we know work. We know that each one millimole LDL lowering will lower risk by about 25% after the first year. We know that larger LDL reductions will produce larger re reductions in risk. But again, as with blood pressure lowering, the tendency is to try to is to talk about titrating up, but but really starting on a statin dose and then never increasing it is the reality. Um, again, I would argue that it's much better to titrate down. I have to say, I studied my in my own case, I studied with 18 milligrams and of a tour of a statin tablets quite big. Um, uh, so I titrated, titrated myself down, if you like, to 40 milligrams. Um, and I think that's a, you, a better way of, of ensuring that people are having decided they're at enough risk to get treatment to ensure that they are getting an effective treatment. And, you know, we've seen disinformation over the last two years with COVID, but prior to that, um, and continuing still disinformation around the effects of statins, particularly side effects of statins. So one of the things that we've been doing over the last few years is pulling together all of the recorded adverse event data from all of those large scale randomized trials. Much of it never got into the public domain because it's, you know, there was nothing um, obvious being picked up in the individual studies and published um, back in September uh, data first of all, on muscle pain, which does show about a one in a hundred increase in the first year uh, with normal statin regimens, and then no difference whatsoever uh, afterwards. So in conclusion, my, my thoughts for your consideration is that, you know, maybe over precision medicine may prevent people uh, from receiving appropriate care that aiming to be precise, are, are they hypertensive or not? You using ambulatory monitoring to do that, is that really the right thing to be doing? Um, might it actually result in people who are at high, high risk from not getting treatment? Um, thinking about risk factors rather than risk, leading to people being determined to be at high enough risk to lower their blood pressure, but then not lowering their risk further by using um, statins. This tailoring of regimens, um, the concept of very complicated combination, starting with one blood pressure drug, then combining others in a particular way, this complexity may again uh, prevent people from getting what is probably more appropriate in most cases, um, a combination of a few drugs at moderate doses. Um, and complexity may prevent um, people from getting, in general, from, from getting uh, effective treatment. And as I've kind of reiterated several times, this focus on single risk factors may prevent people from thinking about what am I actually trying to do here, which is lower their risk, and thinking about the combination of risk factor uh, modifications, having determined that someone's at high enough risk to intervene in the first place. And so my, my kind of argument would be that precise population health may well not only benefit more people that are of having more kind of generic approaches where we start with you three moderately um, 
uh, moderate doses of blood pressure lowering and an effective dose of a statin. Um, and, and then titrating down if necessary, uh, maybe not only better for the population as a whole, but may actually be better for every single individual on average within that. That trying to be over precise may, may result in people who would benefit not getting treatment that would be beneficial for them. And of course, we shouldn't forget tobacco. Um, I was interested to see the slide with the, the levels of cigarette smoking in, again, in the, I think that liver disease among the diabetes patients, pretty frightening. The tobacco industry is clearly very keen to give us a perception that tobacco has been dealt with, um, but clearly it hasn't been. Um, clearly it's a problem. Uh, and if we look at the, the deaths that are occurring, these are estimates from Private Jar, from Canada, and Rich Pito from Oxford of the numbers of deaths uh, worldwide every year at the moment, and the trajectory that is going to occur, increasing from five to six million in 2010s to about 10 million by 2050, irrespective of what we do. We need to stop people from starting, but actually, as Richard Peter would put out, stopping people uh, uh, who are currently smoking uh, is also going to be the, the, the rapidest way of getting change. Um, and just to kind of put tobacco in that kind of context, uh, at the worst of situation with COVID, there were about 10,000 deaths per day compared with tobacco deaths of 15,000 per day. So you know, we need to remember the other epidemics that are going on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rory. That was great. I'm glad you uh, accepted our invitation to come. Um, I have had a slide in my PowerPoint presentation for a long time, and it said, we are all hypertensive and dyslipidemic, because I think we are, and you've just shown that we are, and that we should probably, at the population level, intervene and offer people, at least, the opportunity to reduce that risk, either by a polypill or by, you know, a statin and a polypill or one that contains all three or four. The question is, do we offer that to everyone? Or is, is there an age that we start it? Or should we, I mean, most people that we see with events who are young have not had enough cardiovascular risk to be treated. So this would effectively address that issue. So do you have a plan as how we might be able to do it on a population level? Well, it's why I kind of was interested in just touching briefly on the, the potential of the polygenic risk scores. Um, I, I think the idea, at least in principle, of if one had, if one genotyped the UK population, and the costs of doing it are, you know, maybe 10 pounds, if you genotype the whole population, then you can get polygenic risk scores for many different diseases. Um, and the idea that that could then be used to provide um, precision population health, I think is, is not unreasonable. So as I say, it will identify maybe 5% of the population who at age 30 um, might well benefit from lipid lowering uh, in the way that an FH would. Uh, and early intervention um, uh, may well produce bigger effects than we see in the trials, where, of course, you're, you're, starting, you're giving treatment when people have already got damaged vessels. But that same uh, genotype will allow you to identify the 5% of women who have a risk of breast cancer equivalent to having BRCA1 or BRCA2. So instead of, again, having breast cancer screening at a particular age, you could imagine earlier uh, screening for breast cancer, ditto colorectal cancer. You, we use a pretty crummy test at a particular age for, uh, with fecal alcohol blood. Um, could you identify those 3 to 5% that have very high risk, where you would use something a bit more precise, again, at an earlier age, and maybe do it um, at, at intervals? So, so I think that... that it may be that we're actually that we're at a point where we're going to have something that will be much more helpful for population strategies across not just cardiovascular disease but many other conditions. But if if we're all hypertensive and dyslipidemic, shouldn't we all get treated? 
Well, the, the, same relative risk reduction. the question is not whether we're hypertensive. The question is whether we're at high enough risk to want to lower that risk with an intervention. Um, and, and so the, the, what we're trying to do is determine not whether someone has high blood pressure or whether they have high cholesterol, but whether they have high enough risk for using a drug um, to lower that risk. Uh, having determined that they're at high enough risk to want to use interventions, then it doesn't make much sense, I don't think, to use just one intervention um, you, you, because you've decided they're at high enough risk because you're a hypertension doctor, or you've decided they're at high enough risk because you're a lipidologist. If they're at high enough risk, they're at high enough risk to lower their risk with the tools that, you're, um, that you have, which are blood pressure lowering, cholesterol lowering, um, making sure they don't smoke, and also looking at diet and lifestyle. In terms of uh, polygenic risk scores, you mentioned this as part of a population-based sort of measure in terms of how we manage risk. But surely genotyping the population is probably one of the most cost-effective things we can do in terms of long-term health. Well, I think it, 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 it's, really? it's a hypothesis. Ten pounds per it's test, not 10 and it'll give, a test. And no it'll give you risk in terms of all sorts of conditions. I think it's a hypothesis that needs to be evaluated. It's an implementation strategy that can be evaluated. Um, Peter Donnelly has been doing some work um, with GPs in North of England around how you might use it within scores. I think it needs to be built into the system. I think um, it could be built into screening systems. It could be built into some of these scores. Uh, he's been working with, um, uh, with EMIS and um, with the Q risk score. Uh, but I think it's, like all things, something that should be evaluated carefully, but has a potential um, to, to be cost effective. But we need to see. Thank you. So, so this has echoes to me of the polypill um, and, um, you know, I just had a quick quiz at those, those trials and they really reduce risk. And part, our biggest problem in the health service just now is we haven't got enough people to deliver the care we need to, to deliver, not only for like acute events, but let alone for prevention. So I actually, I really applaud the idea of keeping it really simple and giving the whole population the opportunity to benefit. Now, I know from our FH population that although we believe we give people advice about statins and risk and so on, I think we, it, it is not completely clear how well people, for example, take the medication and want to engage with it. And that's in those, as you say, at highest risk. And there are really basic things we can do to reduce attributable cardiovascular risk in the population. You know, it's smoking and it's exercise. and diet you know you know it's, it's the basic stuff now if if you look at polygenic risk scores they will they are a component that is you know clearly getting more and more reproducible as, as we get it better but you still do not account for the majority of the risk in the population so it can be really useful for people at the top tail but you've still got the rest of the curve who won't benefit from those scores in a sense so I like the idea of the polypill. The trial you need to do is kind of the lumpers versus the splitters and just give everybody, you know, a group of people that are willing to do it and want to reduce their risk, your polypill, one group, and then the other ones, do your splitting thing, see how much resource it takes to do all that splitting and monitor all the splitting and see what comes out best. And it may well be those basic things that actually what we can afford to deliver. Just yeah. thought, and I'm a geneticist. Yeah, no, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think keeping it simple and, I mean, clearly for the population as a whole, there are a number of things that it's worthwhile pushing. We've seen the benefits um, that Scotland led on around tobacco um, and um, uh, the beneficial effects of, of legislation. And there are different ways of doing things. I mean, clearly taxation, legislation has been the way to deal with, with tobacco and tobacco control. Um, I think uh, the same is true with say, um, blood pressure and salt. Um, really beautiful trial done in China uh, of salt substitution. I think really uh, providing compelling evidence of the, the benefits uh, in terms of uh, lowering blood pressure and then lowering the risk of, of stroke 
um, through uh, modification of diet. So, so my focus has been, if you like, on, on um, drug interventions, but I think they're relevant to diet and lifestyle interventions as well.